Um, thank you so much. I'm delighted with the award. Sometimes one doesn't think that uh, the work is recognized in any kind of way, so it's wonderful to uh, actually um, know that people uh, recognize the work. Oh, so when I started, um, it was almost impossible to study what I really wanted to study, which was basically language and society. There were very few places that had that type of um, study. I mean, there was nothing on bilingualism, on bilingual education, on any of that. Mm. I studied Spanish, which to me was the, a, a language of my home, but it was a language that I had not studied in. I was born in Cuba. I came to the United States at the age of 10. I was almost 11. Um, I did all of my studies in English only with some difficulties, but I got through. And when I got to college, I started um, taking Spanish courses. Uh, it was a way to sort of get to know myself, get to know what I was about, um, uh, develop a little bit of the literacy in Spanish that I didn't have because I had not gone through schooling in Spanish since I had been in the fifth grade. So um, there had been a lot lost. When I graduated from college with education and Spanish, um, there were, of course, I was hired, I was very fortunate to have been hired. I've always said I've landed in spaces that has allowed me to do my own thing. And that's very important. My first teaching experience was in what was then called the School Without Walls. So it was an alternative school that thought about how to bring the open classrooms um, to the city. It was in a neighborhood that was then called um, Hell's Kitchen, which is now gentrified. And, but back then was a, a tough neighborhood with a lot of tenements. Um, my students were Puerto Rican. For the most part, I was hired to teach them. And I started teaching in English, which is what I was told I was supposed to do. And I remember after the first week, I went up to the director. Fortunately, we had a teacher head because uh, it was an alternative program coming out of the 60s. So there was still a lot of room for ex experimentation. And I said to him, this doesn't make sense what we're doing. I, you know, they don't speak English. I speak Spanish, why am I teaching them in, in English? And he said to me, so what do you suggest I do? I said, you do? And I said, well, I'm gonna to try to teach them bilingually. And he said, what does that mean? I said, I have no idea, but I'm gonna try. And that's how I started. I started, and I think that has defined all my work. It's about what you see and how you fit um, what you believe in um, and how you make sense for people of the lives that they're experiencing, not based on a priori uh, principles, but to sort of negotiate the principles with them. So that's, that's where I started. I was um, very much a product of, uh, you know, what I always say is Fishman 101. You know, I, I always say everything I really learned about language and bilingualism I learned with Joshua Fishman, and who was always very insistent on um, thinking about bilinguals, because he always said, the beauty about bilinguals is that you can see the linguistic aspects in a lot more clear ways than when you have just one language. So, um, but even, even his scholarship was marked by the era, just like I always say, to my young colleagues, you are really the future, you know, and something that he taught me very early. I remember when I started pushing back on some of his ideas, and he was older at that time, and he said to me one day, look, Ophelia, you just have to um, make meaning, every generation, he said, every generation has to make meaning for themselves, and every people has, has to make meaning for themselves. Um, what I know, uh, and what I do, I did at a specific time. Some of it perdures, others are just not relevant anymore. And when you see that what is not relevant in scholarship does not apply, you have to let it go. So I think he gave me permission, and he was old, and I was old already too, <laughs> uh, 
to um, describe what I was seeing, which was very different from what I was reading. Um, uh, but it took me a long time to get there. So I always say I, I was fortunate, you know, because I was in the right place at the right time with mentors who were flexible, who were letting me think, who were letting me think out of the box. You know, I'm, I'm a product also of the times. I'm a product of um, having lived through the struggles around civil rights. I, having lived through the struggles of the Puerto Rican community in New York City, where I have lived most of my life, for more employment, better housing. So that the language issue, issue had all, was always tied for me because I had been taught that or had experienced that to other social issues. Um, it wasn't just about language, it was about social justice. Unless people understand the relationship between language and power, language and, and the development of nation states, language and global capitalism, all of these relationships that we have built uh, around language, we're not going to understand how it is that language has functioned to really make others other, right? Uh, and... Um, and, you know, I've experienced it, experienced it both in English and in Spanish, right? Um, and I'm always very conscious of that, the fact that um, it's not just, you know, if, if uh, that the way in which we have constructed language and that we impose it in populations and that we present it in schools uh, means that many, many, many speakers do not fit either one category or the other, right? I mean, bilinguals have been the ones that have been most affected because you know, they're told that they don't speak English this way, but they're also told all the time that they don't speak the other language this way, the way that it has been constructed. Uh, we as language educators have a responsibility, a social responsibility to make sure that we, um, we allow students to uh, re reflect and to be critical about the language constructions and how this has reinforced a, ra a certain racial and, and social hierarchy. And I think as we have seen lately with the movements uh, that we have seen in the United States in the last few weeks since George Floyd's uh, murder, I think it gives me a little bit of hope. It gives me hope that this is a movement that goes beyond the racial or the racialized minorities and involves all of us. And I think we really have to be all involved. And I think language educators have a huge responsibility to understand the power of language. What I want to make sure that I'm not misunderstood is I think we all want to develop uh, language that is valued uh, in society. I want to make sure that my grandchildren um, do English and do Spanish in ways that are valued here. My family now lives all in Puerto Rico, so um, they're everywhere. But at the same time, the way in which you're going to get there uh, is not by telling them all the time that what they're saying is wrong. That is where it all deteriorates, where you're always judging and evaluating speakers uh, only with the features that you consider valid, right? And I think what educators have to do is think of what is the, um, the, the emergent network of meanings that they have right? And how do you access all of it rather than just some? And I think the more we do that, the more we're going to get them to also, you know, be able to think of what is appropriate here and what is inappropriate. And that's what, that's what teachers should be doing, you know, accessing all of it to make sure that they understand what the children know. And at the same time, think of what is, what is it that you're trying to achieve? I always say you have to differentiate between the product and the process, right? So sometimes if you are 
a, a TESOL teacher, uh, you want them to get to, to make sure that the product is in English, um, the oral presentation or the written uh, essay. But the process through which you do that has to include all of the child. It has to engage the child. And the only way to do that is to make sure that they engage themselves into it. As I think um, Nelson Flores and Jonathan Rosa have said so well, um, there have been these racial linguistic ideologies that we have used to perpetuate these se uh, social injustices um, and to build boundaries so that we can keep uh, some privilege in and, um, and exclude others. And I think um, teachers have a huge responsibility to make sure that students see that. We all have um, uh, in many, many ways adopted these racial linguistic ideologies, teachers, students, immigrants, you know, um, youth. Um, so the, f I mean, you cannot educate children from the time they're in kindergarten to say, to learn that they can only do this in one language and then expect them one day to magically s start using their entire repertoire. I mean, we see that in, in the dual language bilingual classrooms that we have worked in, in, um, in, in New York a lot and in TESOL classrooms also where the students resist in some cases because they just do not have the literacy in what, you know, what some people call their first language um, in, the, in the other language um, to be able to feel comfortable um, writing, especially speaking, they do it at home, it's better, but writing, impossible. Reading, very difficult because there's just not enough reading material in many of in many other languages. And I would never force a child to use language in ways that they do not want to. I mean, that's the whole, that's the whole idea behind allowing them to use their full repertoire. I have to, the work that we have to do is to make sure that everybody, teachers, parents, and students develop what we have called the translanguaging stance, right? You know, what with what Francisco Varela, who was a Chilean biologist, but who did this part of his work in France, calls the loopiness of the thing, right? The fact that there's an emergent network of meanings, right? That, that includes the social, the political, the epistemological, the linguistic, you know, the cultural histories. So all of this is part of our network of meanings and that we encourage uh, students to, um, to bring this network of meanings into whatever text they're working with. And international schools always allow students to write or speak in, with whatever resources they have, but they have to make sure that it is understandable to either a peer, so that the peer can then translate to the whole class or to the teacher in some way. So they can use Google Translate, they can write an essay in Swahili, but make sure that there's a paragraph, a synopsis, a summary in English. Uh, so because I think you also have to make sure that students understand that what is important is the audience. Who are you? Who are you speaking to? And in schools, unfortunately, <laughs> your your audience, your main audience, is the teacher. So the teacher has to understand what you're doing. But but it is precisely this ability to um, to work with all your your meanings uh, that we're trying to develop. So um, I think that that it is it is possible um, to use linguistic resources that the teacher doesn't have and at the same time make yourself understandable to the teacher. And again, it has to do with the, the attitude and the stance that the teacher has. You know, we, we talk all the time about being a co-learner, right? A good way to think about teaching, you know, you just have to, you know, we also talk in, in, in the book that I did with Ibar, uh, Susana Ibarra Johnson and Kate Seltzer about the shifts, right? The idea, again, 
that, that you know, we say that the translanguaging is a corriente. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't, but it's always there, right? Whether we want it or not, it's part of us. Um, and so the teacher has to be able to, to be able to shift according to where the current is, you know, and, uh, but the teacher really needs to almost follow, right? It, uh, they have to make sure that the ones that are navigating the current are the students, yeah.